this is the story of a great big gamble by a handful of men who have to be years ahead of their time. It happens to be the story of an aeroplane, an aeroplane that doesn't exist. If it flies, well, flying in it will be like putting Granny in a missile, just seven years from now. It could halve the world or double the misery of living on it. If the gamble comes off, it could win a billion dollar market. If it fails, we'll be left with a great big white elephant with its feet stuck firmly on both sides of the English Channel. Whatever the risks, the decision to go ahead hung on the shoulders of just a few men. It appears their story starts back in 1956 in the untidy compost heap of buildings known as the Royal Aircraft Establishment Farnborough. 1956. The sound barrier had been broken, but only by fighter pilots. They designed a supersonic bomber and had to abandon it. Yet somebody had the far-out idea that it might be possible to send ordinary paying passengers across the Atlantic faster than sound. So more as an act of faith than anything else, the government set up a committee. The committee itself was apparently quite an achievement because the whole of the British aircraft world sat round the table, even those who didn't really believe in it, like Dr Stanley Hooker from Bristol Sidley Engines. Well, I, I must say, I wasn't altogether in favour of it at that time. I, I felt rather suspicious about it. I felt that uh, we hadn't got a lot of supersonic experience in this country at the time, and, uh, of course, in those days, I wasn't aware that the aeroplane could be made to be an economical proposition. Among the airline people who sat on the committee was the Canadian-born chief engineer of BEA, Beverly Shenston, who's been a critic ever since. My view at the time was that if we want to go supersonic, we should not go faster than about Mach number 1.1 or 1.2. That is, as slow as we could go and still be supersonic. Now, to understand these men, you have to talk about speed in Mach numbers. Mach 1 is the speed of sound, 660 miles an hour when you fly high. Mach 2 is twice the speed of sound, 1320, and so on. For two and a half years, the committee worked at it. And in the supersonic wind tunnels at Bedford, they got down to the thousandths of an inch and fraction of 1%, which make all the difference between profit and loss at these fantastic speeds. In 1959, the committee produced its report, a massive opus which recommended for the first time anywhere that the moment had come to start real work on a Mach 2 transatlantic airliner. The chairman of the committee was a brilliant Welsh civil servant, Morian Morgan. Morgan the supersonic, they call him. Uh, we were convinced that the facts of life as we saw them then demanded that uh, a lot more work should be done because uh, we really felt we were onto something quite good. Well, in the course of our work, this, this sort of shape was evolved as the most likely shape for an aeroplane doing about Mach 2, flying at twice the speed of sound across the Atlantic. It's rather a lovely shape. You really feel if God meant aeroplanes to fly, he meant them to be this shape. This, then, was a breakthrough. Finding how the shape could be turned into an aeroplane was now up to the aircraft industry, the ulcer industry where wrong decisions cost millions. Being first doesn't necessarily mean you stay first. The Comet 1, for instance, could have taken the world lead from the Americans, but it was too far ahead and it crashed. Now here was another big jump. After two years of design and competition, the government chose the British Aircraft Corporation. This meant that the man who'd have the headache of making the thing fly would be BAC's boss, Sir George Edwards, who himself had risen from the drawing board. Sir George Edwards, the world-beating Viscount, the Valiant, the VC-10, the 111, the TSR-2, a man immensely respected by the Americans. Why should he take on this gamble? I regarded it as part of the development of speeds of aeroplanes that have been going on ever since they began. I, I think, for example, that halving the time to Australia is important and inevitable. I cross the Atlantic often enough at seven and eight hour trip times that I'm going to be delighted to do it in three and so are a lot of other people. March of progress can't stop it. 
Now, the other top man was Sir Arnold Hall, at that time boss of Bristol Sidley Engines, who were going to provide the power. He was the man who, years before, had solved the mystery of the comet crashes. Why should he want to push passengers through the air at 1,400 miles an hour? Well, I think we've reached the stage when uh, it's technically possible. I'd like to make the point that because a piece of engineering is technically possible, this doesn't, of course, mean that you should do it. But in this case, uh, I do think we should do it. And the reason is this. Uh, transport systems, in my view, have always had an immense impact, not only on politics, but on commercial viability in the world. I'm not trying to suggest that if people uh, travel a lot, they won't go to war, but they'll certainly trade more with each other, understand each other more. And the ability to travel, to make commercial agreements, to uh, get a large uh, flow of trade between countries is terribly important to the uh, advancement of the world. Now, I think that this uh, type of aircraft can make the next important contribution to this process. And uh, since it's technically possible to provide such a service, I really believe that an attempt should be made to provide it. If one looks at the world, uh, people tend to think, of course, of this project of crossing the Atlantic in three hours, and this is important. One can get to New York and back in just the same sort of time as one can now get from London to Manchester, and think of what that means in bringing about uh, trading integration with North America. But in a way, I'm more interested in uh, the longer distances. Let's think about Tokyo in seven and a half hours. Let's think about Sydney, Australia in 10 or 12 hours. These things do seem to me to be important, and I think if one examines the history of the world, you will find a very strong correlation between the speed of transport and the general activity and the general progress of the world.